my mind, my hands. I pray that you'd use it for your glory. More importantly, we pray that your scriptures would impact our hearts. Each one of us help us to respond accordingly. This is your word. It is alive. It has power. And so it is not on me. Um, it really is on you, what you want to do here today in our hearts and our lives. And so I pray, Father, that you would work in our hearts, each one of us, and um, help us to respond. You still give us a choice, and so help us to respond. We love you. We pray these things for your glory. Amen. I like that. We've been in a series called Gospel, and so we're on message number four. And I want to just walk back through with some, some of those messages with you real quick, just for those of you who haven't been here for the whole series. The first message was called News, and it was a communion Sunday. It was a pretty short sermon. I don't know if you remember, but it was just about how the word gospel means good news. And uh, we talked about um, the town crier as if uh, you had offended the king. Uh, all the people had offended the king, and the town crier came out, and he pronounced this good news that you could be forgiven. And then we talked about a group of uh, prisoners in a prison camp uh, who had smuggled in a radio and they heard the good news that the uh, uh, forces of their side, the American forces, had broken through the enemy lines and how it shaped their perspective and their whole countenance changed because of the good news. And so we talked about that first Sunday, we just talked about how the gospel means good news and how good news changes everything. Paul preached the gospel, he preached the good news. Uh, all the disciples went around telling people the good news. That's what gospel means. So then in our second sermon, oh, I forgot i got to change the slides. Gospel means good news. In our second sermon, we talked about what is the gospel. And that was really two sermons. Uh, both of those sermons kind of asked the same questions. But that second sermon, we said, God saves sinners through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Christians have a tendency to make this super complicated, but it's really pretty simple. God has kept it on the very bottom shelf for us so that everybody can understand it. The gospel is really simple. The good news is that God saves sinners through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so, in order to really understand that, we had to at least give ourselves some definitions because words have meaning. So, what is a sinner? How does God save them? What are they saved from? Those things are important if we're going to really understand the gospel. And this was the sermon where we talked about archery, and we had that illustration about how in New Testament times they would have these competitions, and they would shoot an arrow downrange at a target, and there would be someone down there who would tell them whether they hit the target or not. And if they missed the target, the person would say, sin. It just means you missed the mark. You missed the target. And we defined that a sinner was somebody who misses the mark. A sinner is someone who misses the standard of God's righteousness and holiness. In Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All people are sinners and miss the mark of God's righteousness. Nobody makes the cut. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin or the payment for sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death, um, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so in this message we defined, in that second message we defined um, when sin entered the world. And we talked about the Garden of Eden and we talked about how uh, God had told us from the very beginning that if we disobeyed, that we would experience death. Both our bodies and our spiritual lives would be separated from God. You, you guys probably weren't here. Were you here for that one, Maya? Do you remember? Okay, so that, that second sermon, we, we talked about how um, they were ushered out of the garden, and in the garden was God's presence, right? And so they were separated from God spiritually, and then they couldn't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good, of the tree of the, the tree of life anymore. They ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They couldn't eat from the tree of life anymore. And so they experienced physical death, right? So spiritual death, physical death. And then that sin was like an infection, and it infected the whole human race. So we talked about in that second sermon how sin now affects all of us, and we all experience physical death and spiritual death. So, still continuing on that theme, third message, what is the good news? Second message was, what is sin, and how are we saved from it, and, and how does that work? Third message is, what is this good news um, about God? What is the gospel good news about God? 
And we talked about this passage, Acts 20, 24. This is Paul speaking. I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. He says, my life is not important to me anymore. If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord. He says, there's only one thing important to me, and that's that I can do what God has called me to do. He says, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And so Paul defines the gospel, the good news, as God's grace. He says, the good news is that God is gracious. And so then we had to define grace. That's the good news. God is gracious. What is grace? What does that mean? We talked about this definition. Grace is undeserved favor, undeserved kindness, undeserved love, undeserved mercy. You see, we deserved separation from God because of our sin. We deserve death. But because of God's grace, we have the opportunity to have eternal life. And so the good news is that God is gracious. And Paul says that really is the whole gospel. God is gracious. He chooses to be kind to us. He chooses to love us. Even though we deserve judgment, He, deserve, he chooses mercy. He, deserve, he chooses to pour out His favor on us. The wages of sin, the payment for sin is death, but God is a gracious God. In fact, He's so gracious that He took our place on the cross and suffered death on our behalf. He paid the penalty for us. He died in our place. That's how gracious He is so that He could pour out His favor, His kindness, His love, His mercy on us. That's the Gospel, that God is that gracious. Now, First message was news. Second message was what is the gospel? And we had to define sin and sinners. Third message is what is the good news? God is gracious. And we had to define grace. Today's message is resurrection. I want to talk to you for just a moment about the resurrection. And why is the resurrection part of the good news? Why is the resurrection part of the good news? Because you would think it would be enough that God became a man and lived on this earth with us, and died on the cross in our place, and paid the penalty for our sins. Why do we have to have the resurrection be part of the gospel? Why is that part of the good news? First of all, let me make sure you understand that Paul included the resurrection in the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 15, he's telling the church of Corinth very simply what is the gospel. He says, I delivered unto you as of first importance what I also received. So he says to the church in Corinth, the most important thing I told you was the first thing that I learned. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. So He died on the cross. That He was buried. And that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. So Paul includes the resurrection in the Gospel message, in the good news of God's grace. Why is it part of it? Let me ask you, what did Adam do? What did Adam do? Adam sinned. What was the consequences of Adam's sin? Death. Very good. You're a perfect student, Maya. Thank you so much. The consequences of Adam's sin was death. And so all of mankind experiences death because of Adam. What did sin bring? Death. Scripture says that you're dead in your sins. You're dead in your sins. Look at Ephesians 2.1. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You guys have heard the phrase probably dead man walking. And it brings to your mind the electric chair or capital punishment and the concept of a person on death row. And they are uh, uh, like a dead person walking. And, and I don't know if they still do this. I imagine they don't. But they used to say when that person would go to their death, dead man walking. We have a dead man walking to their death. They're they're alive, but they're as good as dead because they're going to capital punishment. They're going to be dead. That's the same concept. You are dead in your trespasses and sins. Because of your sin, yeah, your body hasn't died yet. And you may not realize this, that you're separated from God. But because of your sin, you will be separated from God forever and ever and ever. It is like a dead person walking around on the earth. You are dead in your trespasses and sins. But look at what Paul says about the resurrection. Remember, Maya said that through Adam, sin came, and through sin came death. That's what Maya told us. For as by one man, Adam, for as by a man came death, by another man, Jesus, 
has come also the resurrection of the dead. And so just as sin guarantees our death forever, the resurrection, if you are in Christ, guarantees eternal life forever. It's a promise. Just like sin promises you the payment of separation from God, the resurrection in Christ promises you the payment of eternal life. So the resurrection is both a promise and it's proof. You see, Jesus can make claims that He's going to raise our soul and put us in heaven with Him forever. But anybody can make claims. Anybody could say, I could say that to you. Yeah, you're going to be in heaven forever. But if I don't come back to life, if I don't rise from the dead, who am I to make that kind of claim? God had to prove that, Jesus had to prove that He was God in flesh. He came back to life to prove that He had the power and the authority to make a claim like that. And so just as you were dead in your sin, you are raised in the resurrection if you put your faith in Christ. And He has the power to make those promises because He came back to life. Ephesians 2, we'll go back to Ephesians for a minute, 2, 4 through 6. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Remember, this whole gospel series has been about God's grace. What is the gospel? Gospel is God is gracious. Even though we deserve death, even though we deserve punishment for our sin, God chooses to love us. So God being rich in mercy, that's God's grace. Because of the great love with which He loved us, that is God's grace. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. He made a way for us to be raised from the dead. He made a way for us to be forgiven of our sin. That is good news. I was a dead man walking, but through Christ I can be pardoned of my death sentence and given new life. His resurrection promises it and it proves it. Now, the most important part of this whole series, everything leading up to this point, what do you have to do? What do you have to do to accept this gift from Christ? How do I respond? We've been watching the series The Chosen in our community group. It's so impacted my heart and my life. And this whole first season is about Jesus calling his disciples. And it's, it's so exciting. Like you're hanging on the edge of your seat because you're watching. And, and it's not all in Scripture. I mean, they've, they've written between the lines to give us the backstory for these people. But you're watching these guys struggle through life and you see their desperate need of salvation from their life circumstances and from their sin. And you see Jesus coming into their life and rescuing them and then saying, come follow me. And so there's a few that we haven't seen yet. Um, a few disciples, Matthew being one of them. We haven't seen Jesus call Matthew yet. In our last community group, we're watching this episode and Jesus and Matthew make eye contact in the end. And you're just like waiting for Jesus to say, come follow me. Like we want Matthew to go follow Jesus so bad we can't hardly stand it, right? Jesus, to each one of his disciples, says, I want you to stop what you're doing and I want you to come follow me. And each one of them, and in that time it would have been a huge honor for any Jewish man to be called by a rabbi because it meant you're going to continue your religious studies. You're going to be honored in the community. It means come and follow me and learn to do what, I'm, what I do. But there's something special about Jesus calling his disciples because these were common everyday people. They were people who didn't make the cut in the rabbinical schools. They were people who just followed in their parents' footsteps, being fishermen. Matthew decides to become a tax collector. Sons of Zebedee, fishermen. Peter's a fisherman. And Jesus says, I want you to stop what you're doing, and I want you to come and follow me. And he gives us this picture of repentance. He says, I want you to stop living life on your own terms and doing life your way. And I want you to leave that life and I want you to come and follow me and learn how to do life my way. Learn how to do life on my terms. And that's a picture of repentance. You know, when we think about repentance, we think about penance. Penance is not synonymous with repentance. 
Don't put those two together. Repentance does not mean pick up your whip and beat yourself for your sin. Repentance is just a change of direction. You were doing your life your way. I want you to come and learn how to do life my way. And this offer, come follow me, this call to come follow me, is offered to every human being who encounters Jesus. Every single person who comes in contact with Christ through the Scriptures, Jesus says, come follow me. Come learn to do life my way. Peter, my favorite apostle because I have so much in common with him, probably not so much in common with his faith, but a lot in common with his mistakes. I just really relate to Peter. I love him. So what do I have to do, Peter? Peter gives us a sermon in Acts chapter 2, and he explains what we're supposed to do. Acts 2, 22-24, Peter is talking to a whole group of Israelites. They had come in for this next feast. Okay, so Passover was several weeks ago, and now Jerusalem is flooded with people again, and, and there's thousands of Jewish men, and Peter decides to stand up and speak to these men about Christ. And Peter is talking to the very men who would have been shouting, crucify him, crucify him. These are the same people Peter's talking to. I love Peter's boldness in this sermon. One of my favorite sermons in Scripture. Because, guys, picture this. These people could have very easily just picked up stones and stoned Peter on the spot. Like, guys did stuff like that. For Peter to stand up, he's just taking his life into his own hands and he's saying, God, I might die here for this, but I'm just going to tell him the truth. And he stands up in front of thousands of people and he preaches this message. He says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. So he basically says, Remember Jesus? God proved his ministry through wonders and signs. And you all saw it. You yourselves know who he is and what he did. So he reminds him of who Christ is. And he says, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. So he says, Nothing happened without God's knowing about it or plans. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. These lawless men he's talking about are the leaders of Israel, the spiritual leaders of Israel. They would have been standing there listening to this message. He says, you guys killed Jesus with the help of these lawless Pharisees. He says, but God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. He says, God cannot stay dead. Jesus cannot stay dead. God raised him from the dead. And then he goes on, now he's talking to Jewish people, so Peter in that message goes on to talk about the Old Testament because the Jewish people cared a ton about the Old Testament. I'm going to skip that part for the sake of time and I'm going to jump to verse 36. He says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And when he said this to him, what, what, when he said this to those thousands of Jews, what he was saying is, That God had made him God in flesh, and Christ means chosen one, Messiah. It says, you, he's basically saying, you guys killed the Messiah. That is what he is saying to all of them. You killed the Messiah. Verse 37. When they heard this, and this is where you'd expect them to pick up stones and stone him to death, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? You know, that's been my prayer for us, for the people online, for the people who've attended this church, for anybody who's heard this series about the gospel. My prayer, I have begged God for weeks that we would be cut to the heart by the gospel. That the words of Scripture would pierce our soul And cause us to come to this moment of truth where we would say, I am a sinner and I need to be saved. What do I do? What am I supposed to do with this information that I've been given? And that's what these thousands of Jewish men said to Peter. What do we do? The first thing Peter tells them to do, Peter said to them, repent. 
He says, you were living by your own standard and your own plan and your own way. You're doing life your way. The first thing you need to do is stop doing life your way and come learn how to do it Jesus' way. Turn from your plan and go Jesus' direction. This comes with following Christ, the offer to follow. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. What does it mean to come and follow Him? It means you trust Him. It means you have faith in Him. It means you believe in Him. This word in Scripture, believe, it's all the same word. Believe, faith, and trust. Now, how many of you guys have ever been to Gitche or been to any camp? Been to Gitche Gumi? Good. Did you do a trust fall? Did you? So you do a trust fall. I should do it. I should make you guys catch me. That would be awesome. 300 pounds. You do a trust fall, and you're supposed to lock your knees and you put your hand, do you put your hand, no, you put your hands like this, don't you? And then you're not supposed to bend your knees because that means you don't believe they're going to catch you. So you keep your knees stiff and you just fall backwards and you're supposed to believe in these people. You're supposed to trust these people. I'm supposed to have faith in them to catch me. That's what following Christ means. It comes with this belief in Him, this trust in Him, this faith in Him. It means that when I die, I am trusting Him to catch me. He has paid for my sins on the cross, and I'm putting all my faith in His payment for my sin, and I'm going to spend eternity with God in heaven forever because I have trusted in His blood. He is my only hope for salvation. That is part of repentance, of leaving life my way and doing life Christ's way. It's trusting in what He has promised. He has promised to save your soul through His payment for your sin. Now, we're almost done. Many preachers, and nothing wrong with these preachers, and I wrestled with this all week, at this point in the sermon give you an opportunity to respond. And some preachers say, okay, close your eyes. And with eyes closed and heads bowed, raise your hand if you want to accept Christ and we pray a prayer together. And I'm going to pray a prayer at the end to give you an opportunity to do that because I don't want anybody to leave here with any doubt. But I wrestled with that. Is that what I'm supposed to do? Some preachers would have you have us come back up and we play a song and you come to the front. I've even seen it where they give you a hammer and nails and you write your name on a card, and you come and you nail it to the cross. You nail your name to the cross. I mean, wouldn't that be incredibly dramatic? I thought that'd be kind of cool. We had pass out hammers, and you come up here and nail your, nail, you nail your name to the cross. I thought we could put Mel Gibson's picture up there with his hand in the nail, you know. I thought that'd be really cool. Great stuff, right? And I think, I think that's great for people to make decisions. In fact, I think Christ calls us to make a decision. There's something about commitment of saying, you know, Peter's commitment when he had to leave the fishing boat and go and follow Jesus. There was a decision made. And we need to make that decision. And that is incredibly important for us. And I want us to have an opportunity to solidify that with a decision. But God has given us an extremely clear picture of what that's supposed to look like. Of the solidification of your decision. He's told us exactly what to do. Look at what Peter says to them next. He says, repent. And then he says, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. He says, choose to leave this lifestyle and to follow Christ and then be baptized in His name. I want you to publicly tell everyone through baptism that you are now going to follow Jesus for the rest of your life. I want you to give public testimony to your faith. Now, let me make this very clear. He says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. For the forgiveness of your sins is not tied to baptism. It is tied to this decision to follow Christ. Baptism does not save you. Baptism is a symbol of your decision to be obedient and follow Christ. 
And the Holy Spirit doesn't come because of baptism. The Holy Spirit comes because you become one of Jesus' children. You become one of God's children. You become, you become adopted into the family of God. And with that comes the Holy Spirit. But baptism is the solidification of this decision. And so what that means today, I'm going to actually lead you in a prayer because like I said, I don't want anybody to leave here wondering if they are in Christ or not. I want you to be able to make that decision. But if you pray that prayer in your heart today and you choose to no longer do life on your terms and to follow Christ and do life on His terms from now on and you choose to put your faith, your trust, and your belief in His death on the cross as payment for your sin then the next thing you should do is come see me and say, I need to get baptized. Because that is what Scripture tells us to do. That's the solidification of our faith. That is the next thing in line with making that decision. I need to get baptized. Baptism is a picture of the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ. When we baptize people, we say, buried in the likeness of His death, and you go under the water. That's a picture of you going into the grave. That's a picture of being dead in your trespasses and sins. And then we say raised in the likeness of His resurrection. That is a picture of you being washed. That's a picture of you being raised to new life. That's a picture of you being promised eternal life because Christ rose from the dead. And so you make that decision to leave your way of doing life and follow Christ and put your faith in His death on the cross, the next thing you do is you come and you say, I need to get baptized because I want everybody to know I'm a follower of Christ. And there's a tank right back here. We just fill the tank with water and the next Sunday we have a baptism service and everybody cheers and applauds because you become part of the family of God and we want to celebrate that with you. If you're ready to make that decision... And I, and I got to be honest, I, I find it hard to believe that some of you aren't. Because you've been coming, and you've been hearing these messages, and you've been hearing the scriptures, and I know that God, God has been calling your name. I know he has been calling your name. And I, I find it hard to believe that you can resist anymore. But God lets it, you choose. It's your will. It's your decision. He's not going to make you love Him. But if you're there, if you've come to the point in your life where you're ready to put your faith in Christ and follow Him, then I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And this is what it would sound like to just trust God. Okay, you can put it in your own words, but if you're ready, you just pray this with me in your own heart right now. Let's close our eyes and let's pray. Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know I deserve judgment for my sin. And I know that you died on the cross to pay the penalty of death for my sins. And I know that that was your grace and your love for me in action. I know that your grace and your love is what led you to do that on my behalf. And so I just want to put my trust in you. I I believe in you. I have faith in your work on my behalf. And I want to follow Jesus. I no longer want to do things my way. I've tried to do life my way on my terms for long enough. I want to follow you and learn to do it your way. And so, Jesus, I give you my allegiance, I give you my life. I will follow you wherever you lead. And I thank you for saving my soul. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, then the next thing you need to do is come and tell me that you need to get baptized. And we would love to see that happen. Let's worship.